Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Conquests of the Longbow. We have successfully uh, defeated a uh, an evil dark monk. Mad monk from uh, Conquests of Camelot? No. And uh, it is time to head to the monastery in the Fens. Alright, so we're here. This looks to be the only path leading to the edge of the fens. Let's make our way down there. Very slowly. Very, very slowly. It is an interesting uh, look to it here. The ground here is boggy and unpleasant. The Normans built well. It would take a mighty army and a long siege to overcome such a place. The towers need to be taller. That 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 is not what a, ca a Norman castle would look like. The fog grows ever thicker. It would be easy to become lost within. Do I have it? Inventory? Oh, hey. Tis a whistle made from a marsh reed, which the fens monk, which the fens monk was carrying. Oh, should have looked at this. It is the fens monk's pouch. The monk's pouch contains nine gemstones. Hmm. All right. Well. How do I know what to blow? I hear something coming through the fog. Tickets! Next! I heard your signal, brother, but I don't know your face. Have you newly joined our order? Aye, and I've been sent to serve here. Step in, then, and be seated. I'll take you across. Although it's weird. All of us look the exact same, and you look different. Oh, I'm sure it's nothing. Alright, do I use a hand? There we go. I don't get to do anything with it while riding here. I want to destabilize the boat and make him fall in. Do 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 do. do. Hey, we're fording the river. Shh! I must concentrate. Silence! I must find my way by sound and field. Disturb me again and you'll sleep at the bottom of the fens this day. Oh, wow, that is... Some people never learn. Oh, it's the same exact death scene. That's disappointing. Can't alter the speed any. Can I rock the boat? I didn't even do anything with that. Remain where you are. I'm the one pulling this boat. I care not to touch this water. How can one grasp insubstantial tendrils of mist? No, I want to do something with him. He watches me suspiciously.
Probably should have saved it. Are you daft? You have no cause to blow the reed here. Sorry, I, I, I was practicing. Yeah, yeah, practicing. Take another quick save, and... Can we talk? Contemplate the virtues of silence, brother. I have business inside. Let me pass. You are new, brother, therefore you must prove yourself. I must have the tokens you bear for the guardian of the gate. Nothing but the tokens will serve to make me stand aside, brother. Uh, here you go. This is not the order of things, brother. I must have the first token before you present this. There you go. This is the first token. I await the rest. Eh? I accept your tokens, brother. Now you may, must prove your knowledge of the lore of the gemstones. This is the way of it. I will pose you three riddles. These are, there are three stones which you must choose to answer each riddle. Oh boy. Alright, let me uh, get to that. The answer section for that. If you are right, you will pass in safety. If you are wrong, commend your soul to God, for you will die here. Here is the first riddle. Whee! I'll build a ship to carry me skyward. If it falls, I'll not be harmed, but I will never tell how it is done. What do I have? Um, hmm... Let's see. Hmm. I I actually don't see this one here. <laughs> Let's see. Alright, maybe uh, it would be best right now to die and try to get a new uh, a new riddle. Alright, well, let's just... Uh, Your first choice is correct, brother. Choose now two more. Oh, okay. Uh, that one was... That one was turquoise, so... <laughs> that is literally not on the list. That's, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> Alright. That's, uh, that's pretty amazing that that was the, uh, based on pure luck. Uh-oh. That was, that was wrong. Bad choice, stranger, whoever you were. I hear the monks dumped Robin's body in the fens after the Guardian cracked his pate. Aye, he failed to study his gemstone lore. I'm not going ne near those fens now and see his drowned soul lighting the swamps with their, with the other will of will o the wisps. He'd be w safe enough with a piece of jet or lapis lazuli in hand. How do you know that? Study my gemstone lore in the book. That's how. I suggest you do the same. All right. Well, let's uh, try that again. Okay. Here you go. And here you go. I must go into battle. Alright, well, again, doesn't quite match the list of answers I have, but, uh... Okay.
Alright, so uh, that was Lapis Lazuli. This is Quartz, although it looks more like a diamond. And... What next? Sapphire. It's actually a star sapphire. Good, here is the second riddle. Sadness weighs upon my soul. My heart aches to be filled. Would that I could steal into my love's chamber unseen. Okay. Alright, so... First of all... Agate? Your first choice is correct, brother. Choose you now two more. Uh, next up, Carnelian. Aye, the second choice, second stone is correct. Choose your last stone for this riddle. And that would be Opal, which would be this one. Well done, br brother. Here is the final riddle. I have three fears. I fear traveling by ship. I fear my wife will be unfaithful. I fear the lies of men. What should I take with me? Um. Alright, once again, uh, Agate. Your first choice is correct, brother. Choose you now two more. Uh, Lapis. Aye, the second stone is correct. Choose your last stone for this riddle. And the last one is, uh, let's see, Sapphire. Ding! I have over a thousand points! Welcome in, brother. Alright, well, let's, uh, let's get a quick save here. Now that I'm here. And let's take a look around. This is the way back to the front gate. There's a monk within in com contemplation. I deem it wise not to disturb him. These cells are cold and sparsely furnished. These monks lead an aesthetic life. The door to this tower is locked. I have a hunch the prior lives here. There's a monk within in contemplation. Monk stands guard over a prisoner that's being tortured in this tower. Oh, well, that's nice. You know, a little bit of torture. Never hurt anyone except for the person being tortured and everything else. The stonework of this cheerless place is dank and chilled by the mists of the fens. Alright, let me uh, see exactly where I need to go. There's spiral stairs leading upward in this tower. Same thing there. It's an empty room. The prior and the other monks are in this refec refectory. Yeah, refectory. Seems to be used as a kitchen, but is as barren and uninviting as the rest of this dreary place. The open court has only a well in the center. Perhaps this is where the monks practice fighting with the quarterstaff. Alright, let's go uh, back here. The prior and the other monks are in this refectory. Hello! I don't recognize you. Who are you? I am uh, Brother Eustace. And what do you do? What do you do here, Brother Eustace? I've joined your order so that I may serve Prince John as he desi deserves. 
Then you're welcome, Brother Eustace. If you can fight, there's not a one of us that wasn't a soldier before we donned the black robes. There are those with good cause to fear the skill of my arm, your worship, or I would not be wearing this robe. Good! We'll have to put it to the test soon. Have you sworn to obey the vows of our order? Oh, I've made many a solemn oath, never fear. Have a care, Brother Eustace. Your tongue is a mite slippery for a man who has sworn humility and obedience. Please pardon me, your worship. Very well, but we are strict here. Any infraction is punished with lashings. Remember that. It's a miserably cold floor. I was actually trying to look at the table. The tables are old and much used, probably left behind by the Normans. The doorway is open, but I can see little in the darkness beyond, beyond it. More cold and unfriendly stone. The torches provide the only light and warmth this room has. The Normans who built this fortress must have left behind this effigy of a Norman knight. Of course, you know, Richard himself is a Norman. They all look the same with a hood over their heads. Can I talk to them? Silence is better than talk, brother. Oh, that's no fun. Alright, um... Let's go ahead and leave. Let's head back up here. The prior is within, surrounded by tor- oh. The prior is within, surrounded by torture devices, with his unfortunate victim strung up on one of them. So, can I go here now? The door to this tower is locked. I have a hunch the prior lives here. Alright, so not there. Um... Alright, let's try going back here again, and actually entering. Answer me! Speak, or I'll put weights on your feet and rip your arms from their sockets! Ahem. <clears throat> Pah! I tell you, Brother Eustace, I've never seen a more stubborn, stupid creature than this miserable dwarf. Aye, he does look miserable. I've wasted enough time here. You're to stand guard and increase his pain in any way you can. When he's ready to talk, send for me. I'll be in the scribe's room. Uh, uh, wh where, where is the scribe's room? You, you wanna, you wanna tell me that? Never see a, seen such a thing, but I can guess its purpose is to cause physical torment. I was actually trying to look at the rat. This place is overrun with rats. I actually just saw a rat outside in the yard today. It's kind of gross. Whatever it is, it must surely have an evil purpose. By the blessed lady, what terrible pain he must be suffering. <coughs> Ooh, uh... Can't compare to a sneeze, though. Alright, let's see. Uh, let's actually get him uh, released, I think. After we talk to him. The dwarf is in too much agony to speak. I can't pull on his body without causing him worse pain than he already suffers. I needn't do anything with that. I cannot reach that part of the ropes, but they run through a pulley attached to the wall and made fast to a post lower down. Oh, over there. You set me free, but but the prior bade you... Shrivelous black soul, I'm no servant of his. S such kindness makes you a giant among men, and men are giants indeed when I am amongst them. How can you just when you still shake with pain? But I am Folk the Jester, don't you know? Court Jester too. God save him, Richard, Coeur de Lion. What? You're King Richard's own Jester? Then our king is free? 
I will never betray my beloved master, so if this is some filthy trick to win my trust... Nay, listen well. I will place my life in your hands to show my good faith. I am no monk. I am Robin Hood. Oh, uh, s sorry. Should that mean something? Only that I'm the most hunted outlaw in all England. You have but to whisper my name to the these monks, and I'm a dead and I'm a dead man. Pray, pardon me. I've been on the Crusades with Blessed Mary, protect him, our beloved king, for many years. Alas, he's still a prisoner in Europe. Uh, we're we're in Europe right now, actually. But how came you here? My master sent me ahead of him, so I escaped Leopold's ambush. But upon reaching England, I fell into Prince John's hands. May he suffocate in awful. He turned me over to these monks who seem to know you well enough. I swear by the Virgin Mary I'm not one of them. The prior swears by the Holy Three, yet he tortures me. How would you have me prove myself, folk? Why should you want to? As I love my king, I swear I will not leave here unless I take his devoted servant with me. And I will not leave here without my verses. I beg your pardon? They're written upon a ragged bit of scroll wrapped around a wooden cylinder. The prior, may the devil feed him dung for eternity, has taken them. The prior seeks to decode the secrets of my verses, but he must not or I will have failed the trust my king placed in me. Return my scroll to me and I'll never doubt you again. Hey, more points. All right, well, let's see. Uh, where exactly is that going to be? Probably in the, uh, in the room. Uh, let's go ahead and take a quick save. In that locked room. I wonder if I can go up the uh, towers. I've saved it, so if uh, anything bad comes here. Yeah, there we go. At the top of these stairs, there's a locked door with a small barred window. Through it, I see a small prison cell with no one inside. Okay, what about over here? I see desks and scrolls inside. This is a room set aside for study. Okay, this is the one that I wanted. It's a scribe's desk. There are steps for, for use in reaching scrolls at the top of the rack. By Venatius Honorius Clementianus Fortunatus, taken from Opera, Patrologia Latina, in the 6th century. Tis a poem entitled Curse on the Ch on the Chef. Black-hearted wretch, all caked in smoke, face like a stewpot, smeared with soot. Like your utensils, filthy black, you three-legged pot, you slimy pan. You don't deserve these verses mine. I'll make a charcoal sketch instead, whose shameful likeness will recall a pitch-black-hearted man withal. And tis followed by a Take It Easy, which reads as follows. Drop business and lawsuits on the palatine. This festive table bids you dine and wine. Let din of law and wrangling cases rest. The day is joyous. To relax is best. The duties of the cellarer of a monastery are described. He must be intelligent, mature of character, sober, have no greed, nor be lazy or insulting, nor boisterous. He should do nothing without the abbot's orders, and do whatever he is ordered. He should not offend the brothers, and should answer with humility and reason toward any reason and reason any untoward request. He should care for children, guests, the sick and poor, for by his treatment of them will he be weighed on the day of judgment. And then, of course, his heart will be eaten by the amet. He is to look after these vessels and all sacred articles of the monastery. He is to give out equally and fairly the apportioned provisions to all brothers. This is written by Benedict of Nursia in the 6th century in his Regula. <coughs> The scroll, this, mm, this scroll describes the death of Attila, as written by Jordanes in the 6th century. Attila had an endless number of wives, as was the custom of his race. But the excess of his indulgences in women, combined with too much wine, caused him to fall asleep upon his back, whereupon a bloody flux from his nose flowed into his throat and killed him. The people of his race mourned him with great clamor. The men cut deep wounds into their faces so they would weep manly blood instead of tears. 
The women wept and wailed and cut their hair. Yet so terrible was Attila that his death can only be counted a blessing. Isidore of Seville of the 7th century wrote the etymologies. Herein is a writing upon the origin of glass. It says glass came from Phoenicia, next to Judea. There is a swamp from which comes the river Belus at the base of Mount Carmel, and it flows for five miles into the sea. The sands are washed clean from the river, and where meals were prepared along the beach and have no stones to place under utensils, they put down lumps of the mineral nat natron from their ships. When the natron burned, it mixed with the sand and the new liquid flowed, but was translucent. Soon, by experimentation with other substances, they developed this art and learned to melt copper and natron within, and afterward to blow the lumps into shapes. A legend says that a man brought a glass vial to Tiberius Caesar and threw it upon the ground. It did not shatter, but dented like metal. The man could hammer it back into shape like metal, yet it was glass. Caesar asked if anyone else knew of the secret. The man said only he knew, whereupon Caesar had him decapitated, saying that if glass could be made that did not break, then gold and all metals would be worth no more than mud. William of Newburgh reports this in his Historia Rerum Anglicarum. It tells of a village at the mouth of the river Tweed in the northern regions. A poor but very evil man was buried, but at night would leave his grave and walk again. At his side would run a pack of barking dogs. The sight and sound threw the people into great terror until he returned to his grave at dawn. Those unlucky to be caught would, would have their blood sucked by this creature. The elders consulted, having heard their other tales. Thus they hired ten bold young men to dig up the horrible corpse and chop it to pieces, then burn it. Yet after it was destroyed, still a plague came and killed most of the people, and it was said the plague came from the walking dead. Herein, Sulpicius Severus of the 5th century writes of the power of St. Martin, who had gone to a pagan village and destroyed an ancient temple. He began then to cut down a sacred pine tree, but the priests of the place objected. St. Martin explained that it was not holy, but the boldest of them challenged him. He said, if you have such faith in this god you worship, we will ourselves cut down this tree, if you will allow yourself to be bound to the ground where it will fall, trusting only to your god to save you. This St. Martin allowed and was made fast upon the ground, onto the ground, where the pagans thought no doubt could be that the tree would fall. As they cut, they cried out joyously, drawing a crowd. St. Martin had no fear and waited patiently, with full faith in the Lord. As the tree fell crashing, he lifted up his hand and the tree was driven back, to fall in the opposite direction, nearly falling upon those who had cut it. Thus were the pagans dismayed and the village brought under the salvation of God. Of course, it could have also just been the, uh, um, that their god was pissed off at them for cutting down his sacred tree. Ah, this fits the description Marion gave me. I'll tuck it into my sleeve. Herein is a most amazing account of the siege of Jerusalem. Christians, Greeks, and Syrians were joined in the assault. Count Raymond, Duke Godfrey, also Robert Count of Normandy, and Robert of Flanders were there. Uh, this must not be the Third Crusade. They built a siege tower of small pieces of wood, all that was to be had, and bound it with leather thongs. They attacked with catapults and other contraptions, and daring soldiers launched stones and arrows from the siege tower. The Saracens within hurled fr from their slings torches and flaming brands soaked in oil and fat, and thus many died upon the sides. By noon of the day dedicated to Venus, the walls were breached and taken. Franks and others poured in poured in and pursued the Saracens, so that the enemy were driven to take refuge inside the holy places. Within the Temple of Solomon, ten thousand Saracens were decapitated. Not a soul was spared, neither the women nor children. The squires and poorest soldiers slit the bellies to search for jewels that had been swallowed, then burnt the bodies to, to thus search in the ashes for coins. After the massacre, the crusaders sacked the homes and took whatever they found there, rich or poor. However, Count Raymond allowed Turks, Arabs, and some 500 dark Ethiopians who had taken refuge in the Temple of David to depart alive after leaving all their money within the citadel. This is written by Geoffrey of Monmouth in his Historia Re Regum Britanniae. 
The scroll tells of Amazons. These were wives whose husbands were killed in war, deeply affected. They rose up and killed all the men who remained, so that all the women would be equally affected. They then turned and destroyed the enemy who had first slain their husbands. They burned off the right breast of the girl children so that they would not be hampered in shooting the bow. The Amazons had two queens, Marpesia and Lampeto, and they would draw lots to see who would go to war and who would remain to protect the home. The Amazons conquered most of Europe, took many cities in Asia, and founded other cities and became rich with plunder. Such fear did they spread that at last Hercules came with nine warships and assaulted them by surprise and massacred the two sister queens who ruled then, Antiope and Orithia. Penthesilea uh, then became queen and fought heroically in the Trojan War. Thus reads the history of Paulus Erosius of the 5th century. This scroll contains a piece of history written by Paulus Orosius of the 5th century. It deals with Vesoras, king of Egypt in 4 AD Anno Domini. Vesoras declared war upon the Scythians and sent an envoy with the terms of submission. This only angered the Scythians. Thinking Vesoras both rich and stupid, the Scythians warned him to beware of the uncertainties of war. Then to forestall the attack on them, they marched forth and attacked Vesoras. They drove Vesoras out of his own realm, but the Egyptian army forced them to retreat until they were too severely hampered by marches to continue their war. Thereupon the Scythians instead subdued Asia in war lasting 15 years. They were only forced to return to their homeland by the demands of their wives who threatened that if they did not return, the women would have children by men of other tribes. Here is a description of a palace in Constantinople called Magnora or Magna Aula, meaning the Great Court. The Emperor's chair within this place was so constructed that it could be raised to a great height, even unto the ceiling, and lowered again. Before the seat was a tree made of gilded bronze, in whose branches were birds of gilded bronze, which would utter notes to match their species. Gigantic lions of gilded wood or bronze had tails that would lash the ground, jaws that opened to emit roars with quivering tongues. This was written by Louis de Prand in his Antipodosos, Antipodosis in the 10th century. From the Vita Caroli, written by Einhard in the 9th century, is a description of the habits of Charlemagne, ruler of the Franks. It says that he was extremely temperate in the partaking of food and drink, especially drink, and abhorred drunkenness, especially in himself or any of his family. He ate only four courses in his daily meal, and most dearly loved hunted meat roasted over a spit. During the meal, he would hear some sort of recital or entertainment of history and stories of ancient deeds. Often in summer, after a light meal of fruit, he would sleep for two or three hours, and he would wake four or five times during the night. He would admit friends, litigants, and do other business even while dressing if the need was urgent. He knew many foreign tongues and was exceedingly skilled in Latin. He valued scholars and had many learned teachers, and studied also rhetoric and astronomy. He would fill his bed with tablets and notebooks, attempting to learn the art of writing, though he advanced not far in this, having started late in life. It is from an Anglo-Saxon manual of astronomy written but a century ago. It notes how the sea flows according to the rising of the moon, and that a tree cut down during a full moon will be harder against worm-eating eating, than those cut down under a new moon. It is not stars, but fire that falls from the sky, being fire which flies from heavenly bodies, for stars are fixed as God placed them in the firmament, and cannot fall as long as this world endures. Yet the moon, sun, evening, and day star, and three other stars are not fixed, and move in their courses through the heavens. Septem planetae, these seven are called. Uh, planetae means the wanderers, if I remember correctly. And I believe that's all of the uh, scrolls here. Okay, that just reads it again. Alright, well, we've got uh, one of our scrolls. Let's take a look at that. It is, a scroll, it is the scroll I took from the scribe's room. Uh, but next, I imagine that the, uh, the prior is looking at the scroll that Folk needs. The prior is engrossed in studying 
a small scroll. Alright, well, in the next episode, we will attempt to uh, retrieve that scroll from him. See you next time, everyone.